Okay. All right. Uh, so let's just quickly go over the vocab from uh, last week. I think there might have been one on the quiz that I hadn't actually given you in class. No. Had I actually had I given you home rule? No, no I don't think so. I went back and okay. watched like the two videos prior. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Prior. Because I, I, I had it in my notes to talk about, and I guess we just didn't get around to it. So, I'll, like, a couple of you went and looked it up and got it right anyway. Yeah, I did. Um, so, I'll just give everybody a gimme on that one, and we'll talk about it today because I think it actually will help. It, it'll help us uncover another dimension of some of these stories. All right, so just real quick then, let's go through these. All right, what's Dada? Or what was Dada? It was an artistic movement from like 1950 to 1920. Uh -huh. And it basically was like irrational and meaningless. <laughs> art. Anything could be art if you say it's art. Yes. A urinal is art. Yes. And it was like in New York and Zurich? Yep, New York and Zurich, yep, mostly uh, war exiles, right? Um, you know, people who had fled their home countries for neutral Switzerland or for what was then the neutral United States, because uh, we didn't enter the war until late. Um, and yeah, yeah the, 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 whole, the, you know, the whole point is to deflate the pretensions of the bourgeois artist, right? It's all about pranks. All right, good. Epiphany, what's an epiphany? It is when, or according to Joyce, it's uh -huh. the moment in which a person or thing reveals its true character or essence, mm -hmm. but it's also Greek for revelation, and in yeah. the Greek domain, it's when a god appears and imposes order. Or yep. in Christian theology, it's like when Christ, divinity, the three wise men. Yes. So the important thing for all of you to remember is the Joyce definition, right? That's the one that I really want you all to... <clears throat> that's the one that I want you to know. All right, Mangan's sister. The character in Araby. Mm-hmm. Um, she's described as a silhouette, illuminated as dark. At first, she's a brown silhouette, but then uh -huh. she is like a whiteness or a bright light in the dark. Uh -huh. um, she's more like just a physical obsession. Yeah, she's the the the, the, the girl that the narrator is uh, fixated on, right? All right, uh, Ioannis. It was the the. Like name, I guess, for uh, Mino Lover. Yes. He's Italian, and I cannot say his name. Giovanni Papini. Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> and he was like a futurism dude. That was yes. Really uh huh. Yes, he, he, he was indeed a futurism dude, yes. All right. Cupid and Psyche. It was a story we talked about in relation to. Um, Songs of Right, yeah, it's, it's um, the myth that Song, Songs of Johannes is built around, right? Yeah. Basically, Cupid's mother was jealous of Psyche, wanted mm -hmm. Cupid to kill her. Cupid scratched himself and fell in love with her. Mm -hmm. She wasn't supposed to look at his face, she did, and then she had to go on all these quests to get him back, and they had a daughter named Joy, mm -hmm. who was representative of the child that was taken from Mino Wood. Yes, all right, good. Father Flynn. The priest in the sisters. Mm -hmm. um, he dies of a type of paralysis brought on by palsy, which we assume is a symptom of syphilis because he was not a nice priest. <laughs> um, he didn't follow the rules. <laughs> and we're concerned, or the characters were concerned about the child being so close to him yeah. given his undesirable actions. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we can see in Father Flynn's character that we talked about is that it seems that all of the family's energy and money, right, was devoted to his education. And the sisters um, are both, um, on the one hand, you know, they're both unmarried, they're elderly women now, and they're also kind of ignorant, right? They've received no education themselves. We can tell because one of the sisters, I can't remember which one, um, is always using the wrong words for things, right? Like, you know, rheumatic wheels instead of pneumatic wheels and things like that. All right. Um, futurism. <clears throat> A rejection of the corporeal body. <laughs> um, uh huh. 
Uh, so this is of the human body and the mechanical mm -hmm. working together. Um, uh, sleep is considered to be um, a waste of time. You're uh -huh. essentially dead. Yep. Uh, and this is an, uh, an art movement that starts in Italy before the First World War, right around 1909. Yep. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, very much fixated on the new, on combining the human and the machine, um, and um, <clears throat> like the destruction, like not just disregard for, but at like literal destruction of the past, right? Like total like fuck the past attitude, right? You know, no more museums, no more libraries, destroy it all. And a glorification of war. Also glorification of war. Yes. And we all see, we, and we all saw how that turned out. All right, did we discuss the Anglo-Irish ascendancy? This is another one that I'm not quite sure I actually got around to mention. I think we discussed it with Yates. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not so much here. Okay, so this is, this is one that you've had before. Okay, do we all remember what it is? When you're English and Irish descent, and you're uh -huh. kind of misplaced, um, we kind of saw a little bit of that in Araby, I think, with, you know, the bazaar being in, I think you said Dublin, or we discussed potentially yeah, every, in somewhere Yeah, everything's in Dublin, right? Yeah, every, right? Everything in this collection is in Dublin. So it was in Dublin, but instead of being mm -hmm. like some exotic bazaar like you think it'd be, it was just a bunch of English uh -huh. stuff. And I think, yeah, we'll, we'll probably get into a little bit more of this stuff today, right? But yeah, well, we're, this is in a lot of ways a kind of class distinction. So the upper professional Protestant classes of English descent living in Ireland. So more on this and how it's uh, relevant when we talk about home rule um, in a second. All right, and eugenics. You may remember what eugenics was. It's like place concentration. It's part of it, yeah, yeah. It's um, in the context of Mina Loy, it was uh -huh. the idea that bad women are going to have bad children. Yeah, and so it's the duty of superior women to reproduce, right? So yeah, so eugenics is really, it's less about specific race consciousness and more about like selective breeding, right? There's actually probably a stronger class element than racial element to it, right? That, uh, you know, people with superior genes should be having more children and people with inferior genes should be discouraged from breeding. And this is a really, really prevalent idea in Europe and the United States in the early 20th century. And as, as we said, yeah, Mina Loy mentions it in the Feminist Manifesto. Okay, so I promised I would tell you what home rule was, what this is all about. So what were you able to gather on your own from looking it up? Because I was negligent and forgot to explain it. It has something to do with the Irish whatever was in the parliament not, I don't think it was a parliament, but uh -huh. um, it was the idea that the Irish ruling themselves, rather than being a, um, a territory of the United Kingdom. Okay, yeah, and I think, yeah, th this is an important thing to remember, right? So what is Ireland's political status, right, in relation to Britain in the year 1900? It's under Britain. Yeah, exactly, right? Ireland is under British, well, it's part of the United Kingdom, right? So in the late 18th century, as Nick mentioned, Ireland had its own parliament. But this parliament was made up almost entirely, well, that was made up entirely of Anglo-Irish Protestant landowners. So while Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom at this time, right, they had their own parliament for making local decisions. In 1800, the, Ireland, the Irish parliament votes itself out of existence. In ratifying what comes to be called the Act of Union. 
And when we see the word union in an Irish context, it is usually uh, in reference to the union with Great Britain. And it's typically symbolized by the color orange. So when you see the color orange appear in one of these stories, particularly in association with a character, that is suggestive of that character's politics, right? It suggests that this is a character who favors the union with Great Britain. <coughs> so over the course of the 19th century, there are several failed, um, what the Irish tend to call risings rather than revolutions, right? And eventually, by the end of the 19th century, um, a group of Irish lawyers and politicians um, decides on a course of action uh, for political reform rather than kind of like physical force um, independence, right? So <clears throat> this starts in 1870 with a group called the Home Rule Association, which is founded and led by a guy with the very unfortunate name Isaac Mutt. It probably, it means that he's probably descended from wine merchants, right? You know, well, Butt is the cask that wine um, <clears throat> is stored in. But I digress. So this evolves into the Irish Parliamentary Party. Which is led um, from 1886 to, uh, to 1891 by one of the most interesting and dynamic figures in late 19th century Irish history, a gifted politician by the name of Charles Stuart Parnell. And what Parnell realizes is that the Irish Parliamentary Party is big enough to decide the balance of power in the Westminster Parliament in London, right? So whichever party the IPP sides with, whether it's the Liberals or the Conservatives, that party is going to get control of Parliament, right? They, there are enough Irish votes that they need to um, <clears throat> They need to win over the Irish party in order to act to form a government. So <clears throat> Parnell leverages this to get William Gladstone who is the uh, leader of the Liberal Party to propose a series of home rule bills. Now, what home rule would do is not completely sever the connection between Ireland and Britain, right? A lot, of, really, what it would have done is restored this late 18th century status quo, where Ireland would have had its own parliament for making local decisions. So, the first bill. in 1886 is defeated. Gladstone's government falls as a result. That's what happens in the British Parliament when your party loses a vote. Um, your government falls and there have to be new elections and you have to form a new one. So, <clears throat> a 
second home rule bill is passed is passed by the House of Commons in 1893 but because at the time a body of unelected aristocrats could uh, basically squash anything that came out of the House of Commons, the House of Lords vetoes the bill and it doesn't become law. Now, in between this time, uh, Parnell um, actually dies in 1891 um, after having been um, sued by one of his underlings over a long-going affair with said underling's wife, a woman by the name of Kitty O'Shea. Um, this was actually done with the underling's consent um, and knowledge. He, he and his wife were estranged, but um, divorce was very, very difficult, particularly in Ireland. And the, the O'Shea's, uh, Parnell was a Protestant, but the O'Shea's were Catholics. So divorce was basically an impossibility. Um, but yeah, so Michael O'Shea sues Parnell. Um, all this business gets out into the papers, um, and Parnell suffers um, a great kind of personal decline. His health fails, and by the end of the year 1891, he's dead. But he becomes this kind of like later on, even though he dies in disgrace, he becomes this kind of larger than life, almost kind of semi-legendary figure um, in Irish history. So the state of this, when Joyce is writing these stories, and he's writing these stories mostly from about 1905 to 1907. Home rule is something that the Irish Parliamentary Party is still pushing but the generation of leaders after Parnell don't have his charisma um, or intelligence. So they are having a much more difficult time getting it across, right? And Joyce is actually living out of Ireland at this time. In fact, Joyce never actually lives, even though he's imaginatively obsessed with Dublin, his home city, he never lives in Ireland as an adult for more than a few days. So while he's writing these stories, he's living in Trieste, in Pula, and in Rome, right? So Trieste um, is, it's now, in North, it's now in Northern Italy, on the border between Italy and Slovenia. But at the time, Trieste and Pula, which is in Croatia, were part of Austria-Hungary. So he's looking at his home country from a distance um, when he's writing these stories. Um, and yeah, this is the basic political situation as, it's, as it stands in around 1905. So, does anybody have any questions about this? Okay, great. So, what do you think of these stories that you read for today? Okay. What's it? Let's maybe like start like kind of where we did last time. Let's look, kind of look for points of connection here, right? Where do we see these stories kind of linking up with each other? They all have a sense of like poverty. Okay. Like somebody is poor. Yeah, and oftentimes like poverty and often debt, right? All right. Good. What else do we notice as kind of common threads linking these four stories? Don't we see the um, reemergence of like kind of like the posing thing that we talked about earlier? Okay, yeah.
yeah, we see posing and like, you know, the, these kind of figurative masks that different characters wear with each other, right? Um, I think probably the best example of that is the way, you know, say, Lenahan behaves towards Corley, right? Which we might, we'll go into that probably in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, what else? What else links these together? Kind of like the need for, like, or to be like someone else, or the wish or the desire to have been, or to be like someone else, like the grass is greener on the other side. Okay, like, yeah, we've got the perspective character in all four of these stories is kind of wishing for a change in circumstance, right? So yeah, this kind of dissatisfaction or desire for something, if not better, at least different. else we see that links at least some of these stories together. It kind of follows with that one. Like, I know with like some of them, there's like the loss of what the person really wants. Uh huh. Like the Doran from the boarding house guy. Yeah. He was like, he really didn't want to get married, but he had to. Uh huh. And then like the little cloud, the the other dude whose name I can't remember wanted uh -huh. to be a poet, but like he's like, I'm married and I'm a little kid. I can't. Yeah, be yeah. Poet. And I think that there's a lot about Little Chandler's um, poetic dream that is kind of ridiculous, right? And it's clear, like that this guy isn't like you can't be a poet if you don't write poetry, right? And he, he has these daydreams about um, what critics will say about this poetry that he hasn't actually written. Um, but yeah. Um, I think, yeah, there, there is um, this sense kind of almost of um, entrapment in a lot of these stories, right? Where someone has maneuvered or is perceived by, by the perspective character have maneuvered them into a position that they can't get out of, right? So this, I think, is the main form that the paralysis in this section of the, of the book kind of manifests, right? You know, this is People who've been moved into these positions by others where they're simply stuck, whether it's you know, you know want of money or a desire to uh, you know be a big shot or um, you know in order to uh, not offend social convention, right? And I did um, suggest that you all pay attention to the way money passes back and forth here. So did you all try to keep try to track the movement of money here as you were reading these? Okay. <laughs> Where were you able to see the movement of money? I mean, there's like the first story, the, the game at the end. Uh-huh. Like the, I want to say the poses game. The game. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're playing cards anyway, right? Yeah. And then in the second one, how, um, the, uh, I don't remember the names at all, but mm -hmm. the dude is like basically making the maid steal from her employer. Yeah, yeah, this, 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 this guy, Corley, um, is getting, initially it seems he, he's getting this, this girl to either steal things from her boss or to spend whatever her salary is on gifts for him. And then, yeah, at the end of the story, he comes out with the gold, with, you know, with the gold coin, right? Um, which she must, like, she must have stolen. But he had flashes of other dude, like, yeah, yeah. So, 
Go ahead. Sorry. And then in the boarding house, uh -huh. um, she wants, she like, she like sets him up to where like, uh -huh. he kind of has to marry her and it'll be like kind of for like money because um, I think, yeah, he's successful. So there would be yeah, but the, there's all this talk about reparation, right? When we talk about reparation, we're usually talking about some kind of financial settlement, right? That reparation must be made. So what's the commodity that he has to pay for? Her yeah. So this actually kind of goes back to the Mina Loy Feminist Manifesto, right? Which I think is actually written after this story but is dealing with a similar issue, right? Where you have Polly's, um, Polly Mooney's virginity is the commodity here that Doran then has to pay for, right? Well, let's, you know, th that's actually a good question, and I think one of the things that we might want to point to is what some of the implied differences are between Doran and Polly, right? What are some of the things that he is um, anxious about regarding her? He, he thinks of her as a little bit vulgar, right? Yeah, like he doesn't want to marry into like a lower like class of music. He'll be like looked at like wrongly. Yeah. I mean, she is also she's a good bit younger than he is. Right? He's 34, and she's 19. Though this in and of itself wouldn't have been that unusual um, in um, 1900 or thereabouts, right? Because the the idea was that a man waited to marry until he was financially secure and then usually married a woman who was much younger than himself um, to increase the possibility of offspring, right? There's also her father, right? Yeah, and it's her, yeah, her father, right, is, the, is disgraced in two senses, right? One, because he's been separated from her mother, right, due to drunkenness and violence, and also because of what he does for a living. Now, do you notice uh, who Mrs. Mooney on page 61 obtains the separation from? Today, if any of us wants to get a divorce or a legal separation, right, where would we go to make that happen? A lawyer. What's that? A lawyer. A lawyer, yeah, we go through the courts, right? You go to the civil authority to make that happen. Who does Mrs. Mooney go to? Yeah, she gets it from the priest, right? So the priest here, the church, takes the place for a Catholic Irish person of the civil authority, right? Now, what is Mr. Mooney doing to make ends meet since his since the priest has approved the separation and apparently decided to like, can, like even like you know decide who gets custody of the kids and all that. It says he enlisted himself as a sheriff's man. Uh-huh. So policeman, I guess? Yeah, um, actually what, what this means in a nineteenth in a nineteenth, early twentieth century Irish context, it means he's what's called a process server. So a process server is basically a kind of legal messenger, right? This is the person that delivers a warrant um, or that you know shows up and gives you a summons, right, if you're supposed to appear in court. So he becomes an errand boy, a kind of messenger for the law, right, for the civil authority.
And let me explain now why that would be considered shameful or problematic for an Irish Catholic at this time, right? So pretty much the entire um, civil government of Ireland was controlled by ascendancy Protestants. And the basic assumption was that if you worked for the government, then you were a unionist, right? So if you worked in the police force, if you worked in the civil administration, um, the center of government administration in Dublin was Dublin Castle. So Catholics who worked for the government in any capacity were referred to as Castle Catholics. And this was a pejorative term. Now this also provides us a link with another story here, right? What are we told about Corley's family and his activities? Corley is actually, Corley's a Catholic name. Or, or well, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an English name, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Irish name. But we are told something about his father on page 51. What does his father do for a living? Um, he is an inspector of police. Yeah, so Corley's dad is a cop. And he's often seen, right, even though like, he, you know, he doesn't have a job, but he somehow holds things together. He was often seen walk, to be seen walking with policemen in plain clothes talking earnestly. So Corley is also a castle Catholic, but the fact that he's walking around with, plank, with undercover cops suggests also that he is uh, an informer, that he's a police informant. And in Irish literature of this period, um, the figure of the informer is one of like the kind of like villain tropes, right? Somebody who rats out good Irish nationalists to the police. Yeah, Brink. Kind of like this whole snitch of his stitches thing. Yeah, he's basically a snitch. But it's, it's like snitches get stitches, but like probably about a hundred times worse. Right? They just get dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But because of his family connections, Corley has some level of protection, right? But yeah, so these, so, you know, Corley clearly isn't a figure we're meant to like, right? Um, in fact, like, uh, there, there are some critics, uh, who have essentially referred to um, Corley, uh, you know, given the physical description of like you know his you know large bulb, his large globular head, um, and the fact that his body is stiff and can't really like move uh, easily from side to side, um, they have described him as an anthropomorphized erect penis, which also kind of suits the role he plays in the story here as well, right? Um, but. We've got Corley doing a kind of similar thing. Like, Corley's story is kind of coming from the other end of the boarding house, right? Here we have, you know, Doran seems to have been maneuvered by the members of the Mooney family, right, into taking charge of Polly. You know, we've got, you know, her, her brother Jack with a reputation for violence, you know, regards him coolly on the staircase while um, drinking a couple of beers. Um, the mother wants to have a talk with him, and uh, you know Polly has you know thrown herself, um, weeping on his bed, right? So it's clear that you know he's going to be made to pay this reparation, right? But <clears throat> Corley 
does the opposite, right? So he goes around and gets women to pay him to sleep with them, right? Now, what's weird, though, about the structure of two gallants? Did you notice anything strange about the structure of this? So we've got these two characters, like Corley and Lenahan. two in the story, which is the more active character? Who's the one who's actually doing things? Corbin. Yeah. And what's Lenahan doing? This guy just lamenting. Yeah. He's waiting around, right, to see if Corley is able to get the money from this girl. So, in a conventional narrative structure, which of these figures would you expect the narration to follow when they split up? You'd think Corley, but it would follow Lenahan. Yeah, because Corley's the one who's actually off having an adventure, right? Now, there are a couple of reasons why this might be, right? You know, there's the simple reason that um, following Corley might, veer, might end up veering too close to pornography, right? given what we know Corley is off doing. And uh, in fact, this story already skirted the edge so much for the standards of the period that it almost prevented the whole collection from ever being published. Um, but we'll, we'll actually we'll talk about that in a second. But are there other reasons do you, why the story follows Lenahan, you think, rather than Corley? Apart from those of like, um, you know, preserving the purity of the reader's mind. Look more closely at the desire for something different. His desire to be more like Corley. Okay. Do, let me for like. Does do you think Lenahan actually wants to be like Corley? I think he wants to be a cool kid like Corley. <laughs> <laughs> what does Lenahan want? Action. He wants some type of adventure. Share Are, the Profit. Yeah, he wants a share of these parts. Like, and this is an interesting question here, right? Why would Lenahan even think he's entitled to any share of these profits, right? What's he doing hanging around Corley so worried about the money to begin with? Is he dead? Is he a gambler? There is actually good evidence for that, for yeah, what, uh, what Bree just said. And I think that you're on the right track as well here, Nick, right? So, go, no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> um, at the beginning, at the beginning, Corley was like, oh, yeah, you can look at her. Like, I'll walk past or whatever. You uh -huh. can look at her. So maybe he feels kind of like they're, like, sharing her, maybe? I don't uh, yeah, yeah, he, he's, he's spending a lot of the time with their apart trying to imagine what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so maybe the, you know, there is the kind of the sense of like vicarious mm -hmm. sexual experience, right? Yeah, like maybe like you know like we have like a friend and they do something like awesome and you like uh -huh. celebrate with them, but yeah. it's not really your celebration. Yeah. But you just celebrate anyway. So maybe he kind of feels like since they're friends, he's like entitled to some of this profit or something. Uh huh. Yeah, and, and Corley seems weirdly like seems anxious to stop Lenahan from trying to horn in on. Right? He's like, you know, you're trying to get inside of her. He's like, no, no, like, I just want to look at her. Right? I'm not going to eat her. But yeah, so um, getting to what Bree was saying with the gambling thing, right? If we look on page um, page 50, can I get somebody to read the paragraph uh, describing Lenahan where it says he became serious and silent when he had said this? Became serious and silent when he had said this. His tongue was tired, for he had been talking all the afternoon in a public house in Dorset Street. Most people considered Lenahan a leech, but in spite of this reputation, his adroitness and eloquence had always prevented his friends 
from forming any general policy against him. He had a brave manner of coming up to a party of them in a bar and of holding himself nimbly at the borders of the company until he was included in a round. He was a sporting vagrant armed with a vast stock of stories, limericks, and riddles. He was insensitive to all kinds of discourtesy. No one knew how he achieved the stern task of living, but his name was vaguely associated with racing tissues. And this is where the gambling thing comes in, right? Yeah, what, so apparently what he does for what small pay he receives is, yeah, he writes for a uh, horse racing tip sheet. And in fact, if you look at the way he appraises the girl that lent a hand, is about to go off with, right? Like, it's almost like he is um, examining a horse, right? Checking out horse flesh. You know, how, how, well, is this, how well is this one gonna run? And so, yeah, so he is a racing tipster, right? So this might actually give us some information on who's in debt to who here, right? So Lenahan is anxious about money because he doesn't have any, right? Why might he be so anxious about Corley giving him the slip at the end of the story? Because Corley owes money. Yeah. Corley probably owes him money for a tip on a horse. So he's waiting around, he's hanging about Corley and behaving, you know, you know, like like you know, behaving like a little toady, right? To make sure Corley pays him back. So <clears throat> This whole relationship is arguably based on a gambling debt. Now, can we compare that then to the end of after the race? So we talked about money changing hand, hands there, right? So how does money, like what kind of money do we see at the end of two gallons? Oh no! The oh, oh, two, oh, two gallons. Yeah. Out, sorry. Yeah. What? What? Like? What? Where, where? Like? What? What's? What is the? What is the form that money takes here? In two gallons. It was like a single coin, right? Yeah, it's a single gold coin, right? So money in a solid material form, right? Like real form, real firm hard currency, right? Now, what about in after the race at the end of that story? There's a lack of money. There is a definite lack of money on Jimmy Doyle's part, right? I think it shows like how, how is it? Aren't they? Yeah, they were drinking a lot and stuff, right? I think uh -huh. it shows that because the one guy, what, was it Jimmy? Mm -hmm. He wasn't, he didn't really ever have money and then he started gambling and then he uh -huh. got money and then he lost it like due to yeah. You know, being drawn to not uh -huh. just, I don't know, like you get money and then you lose it because he wasn't, he wasn't like thinking about it. Really, yeah. I guess. And is he actually giving the other people money to pay for his debts? He's giving IOUs. He's giving out IOUs, exactly. Yeah. He has essentially gambled away money he didn't have, yeah. as you were saying. Yeah. And then at the. What did he say at the end? He said something about like, oh, I'll worry about it in the morning. Or yeah. And then the guy came in, he was like, it's his, yeah. his Hungarian friend who yeah. knows he doesn't have any money and thus doesn't play, right? Comes in and opens the windows. Daybreak, everybody, right? Time to face up to the night you just had. And I think one thing that's important for us to know here, though, is that Jimmy is rich for an Irish bourgeois, right? 
So if we look on page uh, 43, right? He was about 26 years of age with a soft, light brown mustache and rather innocent looking gray eyes. His father, who had begun life as an advanced nationalist, had modified his views early. He had made his money as a butcher in Kingstown and by opening shops in Dublin. And in the suburbs, he had made his money many times over. He had also been fortunate enough to secure some of the police contracts. And in the end, he had become rich enough to be alluded to in the Dublin newspapers as a merchant prince. It's, so what are we so what are we get, gathering here about Jimmy's family that might connect this to other stories as well? They're probably also castle Catholics. Yeah, the Doyles are castle Catholics, right? They started out, or the father started out as a as a hardcore nationalist, but realized it was easier to make money if he accommodated himself to the situation as it is, right? And they've got police contracts. He had sent his son to England to be educated in a big Catholic college, and had afterwards sent him to Dublin University to study law. Now, the Dublin University thing is also kind of telling. So Dublin University has only one constituent, co so it has one constituent college, Trinity College Dublin. So you will usually just see Dublin University or the University of Dublin referred to as Trinity College. Now Trinity College traditionally is a Protestant institution. In fact, in 1850, uh, the Archbishop of Dublin uh, forbade Catholics from attending Trinity College, arguing that um, it would kind of inculcate Protestant values in them. So <clears throat> we're seeing in Jimmy's father anyway, right? a lot of accommodation with the system. And in fact, it's the father who encourages his connection to this rich Frenchman, right, Seguin. So do we ever get the impression that Jimmy is anywhere near the same financial need as Seguin? He owns, Seguin owns a bunch of hotels, right? He is uh, going to open um, an automobile company in Paris, right? And I think one other thing to note here is that, you know, 1906, when the story is written, um, automobiles are not yet for mass consumption. They're speed machines that are pretty much like the province of rich enthusiasts. But is there an Irish car in this race that Jimmy has participated in? Yeah, who are the Irish cheering for instead? If we look on the first page of page 42. Can I get somebody just to read the first paragraph of the story? <clears throat> The cars came scudding in towards Dublin, running evenly like pellets in the groove of the Nas Road. At the crest of the hill in, at Inkecor, sightseers had gathered in clumps to watch the cars careering homeward through the channels of poverty and inaction. The continent sped its wealth and industry. Now and again, the clumps of people raised a cheer of the gratefully oppressed. Their sympathy, however, was for the blue cars, the cars of their friends, the French. They're just anti-English. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, they're, they're rooting for the French because they hate the English, right? Those are the Irish. Although there, there are actually, there are also historical reasons for the Irish-French connection as well. So 
in 1688, to go way back here, when uh, what is called the Glorious Revolution occurs in England, right? The Catholic king, James II, is deposed, and he flees to Ireland, while his daughter Mary and her husband, William of Orange, right, remember why I, I, where I, why I said that orange is the color that represents unionism politically? It's because of this guy, William of Orange. Um, so <clears throat> they take over, and their armies and James's armies fight across Ireland for the next two years. And the Irish or the Irish and the Catholic James make allegiance with the French. In part because they're all Catholics. But also because the French have historically been the great geopolitical enemies of the Brits, right? Then again, in 1798, there is a rising by a mixed group of Protestants and Catholics inspired by Enlightenment philosophy um, called the United Irishmen. And they also try to, make, try to cut a deal with the French, right? They're expecting French help to come, but it doesn't come in time uh, to actually help the rising. But there is still this kind of this connection between um, the two countries, right? But in the situation presented in After the Race, which country is clearly the junior partner? Uh, yeah, the Irish have, like, there's no contest here, right? If we look at the nationalities represented in their little poker game, right? We have French and also French Canadian. Which means that Riviere, um, Sigmund's cousin, is technically a British subject, being Canadian one. Um, <clears throat> we have an Englishman, Ralph. We have an American, Farley. Doyle is the Irishman. And Delona, the Hungarian, is the one who refuses to participate in the game. And the game ends up being between the Frenchman and the Englishman, right? And here's why this is important. If we look at the these very the, the, the second sentence of the story, right? As the cars come scudding in towards Dublin, right, the crest of the hill at Inchicore, sightseers are gathered in clumps to watch the cars careering homeward and through this channel of poverty and inaction, the continent sped its wealth and industry. Think about this, room. like what does it sound like? What does it sound like these cars are, you know, figuratively or symbolically bringing to Ireland? What kind of hope specifically? Maybe think less along the violent political Industry. lines. What's that? Industry. Yeah, investment wealth, right? They're bringing money. And yet they're not, right? Is Seguin in, in Dublin to invest in, in an Irish auto shop? Where is he building his business? Yeah, he's building it in Paris, right? He's building his, his shop in France. And he wants Jimmy's in money as an investment, right? Who 
we look on page 44, right? Of course, the investment was a good one, and Seguin had managed to give the impression that it was by a favor of friendship, the might of Irish money was to be included in the capital of the concern. Right, so Seguin is, are, you know, presents this as doing Jimmy a favor, right? By letting him invest in his business. So anyway, you slice this, even if Seguin is honest and on the level, and is not just trying to take Jimmy for everything he's got, this is still Irish money actually being extracted from the country, right? Taken out of Ireland and brought to France and making Jimmy into a debtor. So the Irishman becomes indebted to the Frenchman. And given that he's passing out IOUs like candy, right? It seems to be a debt that he probably can't pay. Which I then think pairs nicely with Lenahan's anxiety about Corley getting the money. Because he's worried that Corley's going to welch on the debt. Because he knows that this bastard doesn't have a job. Now, we haven't really talked about a little cloud at all. And this is like the only one of these stories where we see a young Irish family, right? And like an actual household set up here that's not like transitional in some way, right? So little Chandler actually seems to have what Lenahan says he's dreaming about in um, in two gallons. So if we look at two gallons on page 58, right? Um, can I get somebody to read uh, from, he would be 31 in November, top of page 58. He would be 31 in November. Would he never get a good job? Would he never have a home of his own? He thought how pleasant it would be to have a warm fire to sit by and a good dinner to sit down to. He had walked the streets long enough with friends and with girls. He knew what those friends were worth. He knew the girls too. Experience had embittered his heart against the world, but all hope had not left him. He felt better after having eaten than he had felt before, less weary of his life, less vanquished in spirit. He might yet be able to settle down in some snug corner and live happily if he could only come across some good, simple-minded girl with a little of the ready. So, what's his fantasy? What does he want? Life, just like some. Yeah, he wants like, a, like a, a, a typical Victorian bourgeois life, right? But who's got to supply the money? The wife. Yeah, so he, he can't help thinking like a parasite, right? <laughs> now, if we look at little Chandler's friend, Ignatius Gallagher. It seems like Chandler is like has the life that Lenahan was dreaming about and yeah. Chandler wants Lenahan's uh -huh. life. Like he wants to be like his friend who traveled everywhere and goes here and there and does Yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, Chandler is envious of Gallagher, right? But also a little bit contemptuous of him, right? But he thinks that Gallagher used, you know, is a little bit vulgar. Um, and you know, he writes mere journalism while little Chandler would write poetry would write poetry, right? Doesn't actually write poetry. Um, but like, what, we're told that Lenahan has gray, he's only 31, right? But he has thin graying hair, right? And so does Ignatius Gallagher. Lenahan works for um, a racing tip sheet. Gallagher is a journalist, right? So in Ignatius Gallagher, we have a successful Lenahan, right? He's not, you know, married with a family like Lenahan would like to be, but he is a financially successful Lenahan, basically. Now, little Chandler mm. 
you know, I just, I, the thing I love about this story is just like reading the things that he fantasizes about and like the kind of ridiculous, um, ridiculous notions he gets about poetry. So he is a writer, right? Chandler is a writer, but what kind of writing does he actually do for a living? I had a feeling you were going to ask. <laughs> what his job is, I would have said writing. I don't uh -huh. yeah. wait. <laughs> do I think he works for the press in some way. Uh, actually, he does not. On page 71, right, as he sat at his desk in the King's Inns, he thought of the changes that his eight years had brought. The friend whom he had known under a shabby and necessitous guise had become a brilliant figure in the London press. He turned often from his tiresome writing to gaze out the office window. So King's Inns. Is where the law offices were situated. So, what Little Chandler actually does for a living, right? Have any of you read Bartleby the Scrivener? Yep. I would prefer not to, yeah. He does the same thing Bartleby did, right? He's a law copyist. he actually does is copy out deeds and wills and other kinds of legal documents. So all very prosaic, none of it creative, right? Now then if we look on page 73, why don't you read for us the last paragraph on the page, starting with, um, every step brought him nearer to London. Every step brought him nearer to London, farther from his own sober artistic life. A light began to tremble on the horizon of his mind. He was not so old, 32. His temperament might be said to be, to be just at the point of maturity. There were so many different moods and impressions that he wished to express in verse. He felt them within his soul. He tried to weigh his soul to see if it was a poet's soul. Melancholy was the dominant note in his temperament, he thought, but it was a melancholy tempered by recurrences of faith and resignation and simple joy. If he could give an expression to it in a book of poems, perhaps we would listen. He would never be popular, he saw that. He could not sway the crowd, but he might appeal to a little circle of kindred minds. The English critics, perhaps, would recognize him as one of the Celtic schools by reason of the melancholy tone of his poems. Besides that, he would put in allusions. He began to invent, invent sentences and phrases from the nemesis which his book would get. Mr. Chandler has to give an easy and graceful verse. A wistful sadness pervades these poems. The Celtic note. It was a pity his name was not more Irish looking. Perhaps it would be better to insert his mother's name before the surname. Thomas Malone Chandler. Or better still, T. Malone Chandler. He would speak to Gallagher about it. <laughs> and you know, like, this always makes me laugh at the poor sap. Like, I, just, I, I can't help it, right? Like, so instead of you know composing lines of poetry in his head, what's he writing as he walks? Reviews for his poetry. Yeah, he's writing reviews of poetry he hasn't even written yet. <laughs> this is what the English critics will say about my poems, right? Yeah. It'll sound better. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, let's see, look, the way he wants his name to be uh, spelled out on his publication, but T. Malone Chandler. What? Why does he want it to be like this? Because it's more Irish. Yeah, because it I sounds more Irish. Go ahead. I feel like everybody's done this before. Oh, though. absolutely. Like, if you're like, oh, I'm going to be a pop star, you're like, oh, my name is uh -huh. my name. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, and like everybody has these kinds of fantasies, right? It's like, you know, well, this is what they would say about me if I was a famous author, or this is what they would say about me if, you know, if my band didn't suck, you know, or whatever, right? <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, he, he, yeah he, he, he wants a more authentically Irish name, right? But he wants a more authentically Irish name in order to appeal to who? Gallagher. 
the English critics. Yeah, to, yeah, because he, he wants the English critics to detect the Celtic note in his poetry, right? It's all for the benefit of the English critics. And specifically here, I think he's thinking in terms of Matthew Arnold's distinction between the Celt and the Saxon, right? You know, where the Saxon is practically minded and orderly and organized, and the Celt is dreamy and impractical and given to fantasies and romantic, right? But yeah, he's building his model of an Irish poet in these Arnoldian terms. And I also think it's kind of funny and ironic too. It's like as he's thinking about this Irish poetry he's going to write, this Celtic poetry, where is he imagining every step taking him closer to? Yeah. So it's kind of clear here that the way he's conceiving of Irish poetry is very much in a way that's designed to appeal to English audiences. So it's a kind of cod Irish identity. That's intended not so much for his own countrymen in boring old Dublin where he feels stuck, but for you know, those across the water, like where people like Gallagher have been made it, right? And did you notice what color Gallagher's tie is? Orange. Yeah, Gallagher is wearing an orange tie, suggesting where his political allegiances are. That Ignatius Gallagher is actually like a good Irish Catholic sounding name, right? Unlike Thomas Chandler. But, yet yeah, Gallagher seems to have adopted unionist politics, maybe even just as a matter of convenience, right? But there's a term that is going to pop up in later stories that I think it's going to be good for us to maybe keep in, keep in mind right now. West Britain. So a West Briton, right, this is a pejorative term that was used for an Irish person um, who adopted English values. And Little Chandler and Gallagher are both West Britons, but in different ways, right? That <clears throat> Gallagher has used England as a kind of stepping stone to success as a journalist. And Chandler is, can, you know, can't think of himself in terms of pleasing an Irish audience, only an English one. All right, so we're about out of time here. Does anybody have anything else they want to add or any questions about any of this? I just have a question. It's not necessarily about this, but yeah. just. My basic knowledge of Ireland is that there's a Northern Ireland now, and then like a Southern Ireland. That is correct. The Northern Ireland is still part of Britain, right? Yes, the six counties in the north of Ireland are still part of the United Kingdom. This is because um, when Ireland declared independence in the early 1920s, those six counties, four out of six of them were majority Protestant, and the other two were bare majority Catholic. Um, so they did not want to be, uh, to be part of an Irish Republic. And so they were excluded from the, uh, the treaty that the Irish signed with the English. And this is still um, a huge political state. It's not as big a political third rail as it used to be. Um, things have calmed down a lot since like the early 90s. Um, but it's becoming an issue now with Brexit. Which is probably why that comes back into the news again, you know, because you've got, you know, the rest of Ireland is still part of is part of the eurozone, um, and you know still has these free trade agreements with the rest of Europe, and now the North doesn't. So yeah. All right, let me give you the guy.